Hi, here are five horrifying true crime stories that will shock you. Subscribe to the channel and we'll move on to the first story. The holiday is over, yet its reverberations linger in the souls of the Hutchings family. Halloween stands as the sole evening annually when creatures benignly wander amongst us. It's an occasion where all don costumes and masks embarking on a playful venture. But consider if beneath one of those disguises lurks a genuinely malevolent being, intent on transforming nightmares into actuality. Nicole Marie Hutchings, affectionately called Nikki by her close ones, was born in San Francisco, California, on the 15th of June, 1983. Her biological father was replaced by a stepfather, James Hutchings, yet their bond was so profound it mirrored that of a natural father and daughter. From her early years, James nurtured Nicole as if she were his own, earning the endearing title, Dad, from her. As time passed, two additional children, Amanda and Timothy, were welcomed into the Hutchings' fold. Following James's departure from the Marine Corps in 1987, he, along with his spouse Robin, chose to bring up their offspring in a more serene setting. They relocated to Bend, Oregon, where Nikki experienced her first snowfall. Nestled in the core of Oregon's Cascade Mountains, Bend boasted an idyllic blend of outdoor adventures, including skiing, mountain biking, and trekking, alongside a flourishing arts community, replete with a dynamic arts scene, a burgeoning craft beer sector, and an array of gastronomic venues. This juxtaposition is evident in the town's scenery, where quaint brick edifices and verdant tree-fringed avenues grace the downtown district, and at a distance, lofty pines and rugged mountain summits prevail. It was in this locale that the Hutchings clan found their home, settling into an idyllic three-bedroom, two-bath residence perched along the Deschutes River's edge, with the river flowing directly into their backyard, presenting endless fishing prospects. Once, Nikki's parents brought the young girl to Drake Park, a favorite among the city's green spaces, renowned for its array of events throughout the year, including musical evenings and open-air cinema showings. It also served as an ideal spot for tranquil nature strolls. It was in this setting that Nikki, upon seeing duck sculptures for the first time and struggling with her early speech, affectionately dubbed her grandfather Grandpa Duck. As Nikki matured, the park continued to hold a special place in her heart, remaining a preferred spot in the city. Eager for school, Nikki looked forward to acquiring new knowledge. Additionally, she had a passion for hiking, crafting, and composing poems. She was a student at Mountain View Middle School, where she was well-liked by many peers, though her frankness occasionally led to confrontations, including one significant altercation that resulted in her expulsion. After finishing her schooling in 2004, Nikki made her way back home. The Hutchings family cherished their moments together in their abode, by then, they had relocated to a comparable three-bedroom, two-bathroom residence, situated a 15-minute drive from their previous location in a more densely populated suburban area. Positioned at the end of a cul-de-sac, the Hutchinson home boasted stunning views of the mountains. With the annual celebration of All Saints Day, or Halloween as it's widely recognized, on the horizon, the children of Bend, akin to their counterparts across the United States, delighted in dressing up for trick-or-treating. Nearly every home was adorned with decorations, and residents prepared sweets in anticipation, warmly welcoming the small witches and phantoms who would visit. By this period, the Hutchings' offspring had matured, finding themselves more captivated by gatherings and celebratory events than the tradition of trick-or-treating. Nikki had reached the age of 21, Amanda was 17, and Timmy had just celebrated his 13th birthday. On the evening of Sunday, October 31st, 2004, Amanda was preparing for her shift at a nearby department store, planning to conclude her duties around 8 p.m. Lacking a driver's license, she depended on her parents or Nikki for a ride home. Despite the store's proximity, Amanda hesitated to trek back alone after dusk, particularly on Halloween. Hence, she requested Nikki for a pickup but Nikki had plans to stay in, distributing sweets. Their dad, Jim, then a bus operator, offered to fetch her, prioritizing his daughter's safety above all. 
Before departing, Nicole, with a grave expression, sought a moment to discuss something significant with Amanda upon her return, hinting at another bout of her imaginative notions. The day unfolded ordinarily enough, with Robin and Nikki engaging joyfully in candy distribution to the visiting youngsters, reminiscent of the times the Hutchings themselves went trick-or-treating. Now, finding amusement in their role reversal, they relished the experience. After Jim came home and dined, he left to collect Amanda and attend to some chores. By 10 p.m., when the doorbell rang again, it seemed too late for youthful jests. With Robin occupied, Nikki answered the door, only to find a pleasant surprise. Several of her friends stood there, en route to a nearby Halloween festivity at a friend's place, eager for Nikki to join. Thrilled at the prospect, Nikki was all set to partake in the holiday merriment. Nikki informed her mother of her plans to enjoy the evening with her companions. Robin, undisturbed by her daughter's autonomous nature, trusted Nikki's responsible demeanor. She bid her a wonderful time, sending her off to the celebration with ease of mind. Unbeknownst to her, this farewell would mark the final occasion she'd witness the joyful grin of her eldest child. The memory of Nikki's final Halloween will eternally resonate with her family. The celebration was brimming with both acquaintances and unknown faces, all seemingly enjoying the revelry. Nikki, having been informed of the event last minute, attended in her regular attire, lacking the time for elaborate preparations. The atmosphere was charged with boisterous music, with attendees engaging in typical youthful merriment, drinking, dancing, and reveling deep into the early hours of November 1st. As the spectral night's excitement faded and life's regular rhythm resumed, the Hutchings family too began their day, immersed in routine morning activities. It was during this time that Jim realized Nikki's absence. Her bedroom was empty, a stark contrast to the last memory he had of her, diligently filling out a job application. Returning the previous evening with Amanda, he had presumed Nikki was asleep. Upon learning from Robin that Nikki had ventured to a Halloween festivity, Jim initially thought she might be recuperating from the night's excesses at a friend's house, expecting her return or a call by midday. However, as daylight waned and normalcy enveloped the town, Nikki's presence remained conspicuously absent. Her belongings, including her purse and identification, lay undisturbed in her room, a silent testament to her unanticipated departure. Concern deeply rooted in their hearts, her parents initiated a series of calls to Nikki's friends, desperate for any clue of her whereabouts. The evening was consumed with efforts to trace her, a prelude to the harrowing decision of involving law enforcement. Despite their exhaustive inquiries, Nikki's location remained a mystery. At this juncture, the Hutchings family was overwhelmed by a foreboding sense of dread prompting them to contact the Bend Police Department. At the station, they were informed that Halloween night is notoriously one of the worst nights of the year due to a significant surge in criminal activity. The period is rife with car break-ins, vandalism, alcohol-related offenses, violence, and even fatal crimes. The police typically do not immediately respond to reports of missing adults, as many return after a short period. However, the fact that Nikki's money and identification were still at home raised concerns. The Bend police were aware that Nikki was 21 years old, stood at 5 feet 5 inches, weighed 159 pounds, and had chestnut hair and blue eyes. Additional unique identifiers included a small gap between her front teeth, a pierced tongue, and tattoos of a rose and a dolphin on the back of her left shoulder. She was last seen wearing a dark burgundy polo shirt with an emblem, black pants, and white tennis shoes. Detective Brian Kendall from the Bend Police Department met with the Hutchington family to compile a comprehensive report. He spoke with Robin, Amanda, and Jim, who shared their insights. Amanda mentioned that her sister wanted to discuss something serious with her that evening. The parents informed the detective about Nikki's ex-boyfriend, Bobby. Initially, he was well-liked by the family, appearing very charming and fitting in well, but over time they began to suspect that he was concealing his true nature, especially concerning Nikki. Detective Kendall resolved to pursue the individual for any further details, 
He intended to question Nikki's acquaintances regarding the whereabouts of the Halloween celebration, including inquiries about the organizer and all attendees. Concurrently, the Hatchings family was engulfed in distress, given the absence of any updates on Nikki for more than a day. Upon meeting Bobby, the detectives inquired about Nikki. He insisted he was not monitoring his former partner, noting their separation had occurred just the weekend before. Despite the detective's skepticism, a lie detector test indicated he was truthful. It was later established that he had an alibi for the night of Halloween, prompting the authorities to shift their focus elsewhere. The Bend police force released a statement soliciting any information regarding Nikki Hutchings, urging the public to reach out to Detective Kendall. A woman named Mary came forward with crucial information. She mentioned her cohabitants, Lauren Bowers and Craig Whiting, had hosted the Halloween festivity Nikki attended. Bowers had a girlfriend with two children. One was six years old and the other was four. Nikki would constantly come over to look after them, and that's how she met Mary. At the party was nothing unusual about it. Many people came and went during the night, and some brought friends along. At least the detectives now had two people they could contact. Quickly obtaining the address, the police officers went to Lauren and Craig to find out more details. That's how they spoke with Bowers' 30-year-old girlfriend. Craig was identified as a close acquaintance of the Hutchings and frequently visited in the evenings to extend party invitations to Nikki. He recalled seeing her last at the party close to midnight, a time when alcohol consumption was rampant, leaving everyone clueless about her subsequent whereabouts. While her friends were deeply concerned for her safety, they remained hopeful for her return. Alas, she had vanished without a trace since the event. Investigators questioned other attendees of the gathering, yet no one could precisely recall the moment of her departure. It seemed as though the young woman had abruptly vanished into thin air. The police pondered various scenarios. Had Nikki exited the premises by herself that evening? Was she under the influence? Or had she been kidnapped? Could there have been an individual with nefarious intentions lurking? However, with no definitive answers at hand, they proceeded with their probe, deciding to broaden the search to include areas beyond the state lines. Nikki's photograph, together with comprehensive details regarding her vanishing, was circulated among law enforcement agencies nationwide. With the absence of fresh leads, investigators opted to scrutinize the backgrounds of the residents of the home where the festivity was held, in addition to the attendees. It was imperative to begin their inquiry from some point. Craig was found to have a clean criminal history, whereas Lauren Bowers appeared to have a questionable incident related to Nikki. The revelation was shocking. It emerged that the man had been a convicted offender a decade ago. Lauren had faced accusations of contributing to the delinquency of minors. Now, age 34, he openly acknowledged his previous wrongdoing to Detective Kendall, offering his cooperation in the search for Nikki as a gesture of his reformed character. This information was disconcerting, yet no direct link or proof suggested Lauren's involvement in Nikki's disappearance. The investigation was still in its preliminary phase of collecting information. In the meantime, Nikki's relatives initiated a community search in Bend. They disseminated leaflets bearing her image and particulars, engaged with local broadcasters, and reiterated their appeal for any leads to be reported to the authorities. Subsequent reports claimed sightings of the young woman in various locales within the city, albeit without verification. Nonetheless, these accounts provided the Hutchings family with a glimmer of hope. Jim, employed as a bus operator, would meticulously survey Drake Park, Nikki's cherished locale, each time he drove by in the hopes of spotting her. Accepting the grim reality of her absence was a challenge for the family, who clung to the hope of her return. Each knock at the door raised expectations that it might be Nikki, yet it never was. The situation then took a grim twist. An informant disclosed to the police that an individual known as Spider had admitted to his acquaintances that he was responsible for Nicole's murder and had concealed her remains on his property. His actual identity was Danny Shane, a felon affiliated with a local gang dubbed the Park Rats, notorious for their criminal activities in Bend, 
especially around Drake Park. Nikki and Danny Shane were familiar with each other, having been classmates in middle school, though Spider had undergone significant changes since those days. When interrogated, he asserted that he had encountered the young woman a few weeks prior, aligning with the timeline of her vanishing. After successfully completing a polygraph examination, he was exonerated and released. The aerial units of the Bend Police Department were deployed to scrutinize Danny's land from the sky in search of any signs of soil disturbance indicative of a burial site, but their search yielded no results. As days turned into weeks and then months, the hatchings prepared themselves for the possibility of receiving dire news, with the likelihood of Nikki being found alive dwindling. Nikki's 13-year-old sibling, Tim, who looked up to her immensely, was particularly devastated, leaving the family in a state of disarray. In a subsequent development, the Portland Police Department in Oregon reached out to the Hatchings family. The call they received was one no family ever wishes to get. They were informed about the discovery of a body that bore a resemblance to Nikki, and they were summoned for identification. The news sent shockwaves through the family, but Jim had one pressing inquiry, whether the deceased had a dolphin tattoo on her left shoulder. The agonizing wait for a response seemed endless, with the family grappling with the possibility of Nikki's demise. The moment the officer informed Jim that the discovered body lacked the tattoo, a fleeting relief washed over the hatchings. Nonetheless, they were painfully aware that this meant another family would soon be confronted with heartbreaking news concerning their loved one. Investigators monitored Nikki's financial and digital footprints, including her credit card, bank account, and cell phone. After months of perseverance, they were alerted to activity on one of Nikki's cards, igniting a flicker of hope that she could be alive. This hope was swiftly dashed when Nikki's mother, Robin, disclosed she had been using her daughter's credit card, dashing any renewed hope. As time progressed, interactions with the detectives became less frequent, reflecting the stagnation of the case, and life for the hatchings seemed to pause. Amanda pursued her high school studies and had applied to colleges, including the University of Minnesota, where she awaited acceptance letters. These aspirations now felt insignificant in the shadow of her sister's disappearance. However, she was later informed of her acceptance to the University of Minnesota with a full scholarship. Despite the joy this brought, she found herself unable to leave her family during such a distressing period. The narrative surrounding Nikki Hutchings' disappearance only unfolded after three painstaking years. It became evident that someone was concealing a vital piece of information, possessing full knowledge of the events that transpired, but lacking the courage to disclose the truth. In March 2007, a woman known as Jenny entered the Bend police station seeking to speak with the detective leading the Hutchings investigation. As an old acquaintance of Nikki and the former girlfriend of Lauren Bowers, with whom she had two children, Jenny was driven by their rocky past and subsequent breakup to share what she knew. Initially interviewed after Nikki vanished, she had lied to protect herself. Jenny disclosed that Lauren, her ex, confessed to ending Nikki's life, though at that time, there was no concrete proof or remains to corroborate his admission. The detectives devised a strategy, persuading Jenny to covertly record a conversation with Lauren by wearing a wire and probing him about Nikki. The meeting was set in a park where Jenny, under immense pressure, inquired about Nikki's fate. Lauren, initially wary, eventually confided in Jenny due to her previous silence. He justified his actions by alleging Nikki was a threat to their relationship and he could not risk returning to jail. Jenny's persistent questioning nearly compromised the operation, yet managed to secure Lauren's confession. Lauren was apprehended on March 12th, a measure taken partly to safeguard Jenny from potential repercussions. Further investigations into Lauren's past unveiled two prior convictions for sexual assault, resulting in a two-year prison sentence. His victims were aged between 13 and 16. Post-release in 1997, Lauren briefly evaded his parole obligations and was later convicted for unlawful possession of a firearm, theft, and lying to the police. Upon arrest, 
An emotional Lauren denied any involvement in Nikki's disappearance, accusing his friend Craig Whiting of framing him, a claim that ultimately proved true. Craig Whiting, who came to pick up Nikki on that Halloween evening, was a close family friend of the Hutchings, having lived under the same roof with them for some time. He took a deep breath and stated that Lauren had asked him to help get rid of the girl. Craig said that Nikki had started spreading rumors about Lauren, alleging that he had inappropriately touched one of the children she was babysitting. If this were to come out, it would land Bowers back in prison. The children had told Nikki about Lauren's inappropriate actions and how he had photographed one of them without clothing. It was a serious accusation that could have severe consequences. Nikki informed the child's mother about the incident and then went further by filing a formal complaint with the Oregon Department of Human Services. Lauren understood that this could land him back in prison and decided to take drastic action. But how did Craig fit into all of this? It turned out that Craig had a disturbing childhood experience that had a profound impact on his psyche. When he was 11 years old, his mother's partner beat her to death and then hid her body in the basement under their trailer, where they lived next to the decomposing remains for several weeks. Perhaps this left a mark on Craig's entire life. However, he justified his actions regarding Nikki by claiming that Lauren was like a brother to him. If a brother asked for help, he felt obliged to do everything for him. It took a couple of days before Craig agreed to show detectives where they had buried Nikki's body. This helped him avoid the death penalty, but he showed no remorse or compassion. It was a very remote area in the middle of the forest, about 20 miles from the Halloween party location. Craig led the police to a spot amidst the trees where, according to him, Nikki met her demise. In a shallow grave, Officers found what they believed to be Nikki Hutchings's remains. Nikki had done everything possible to protect an innocent child and ensure their safety, only to encounter the monster who would likely silence her rather than face the consequences of his despicable actions. As early as October 2004, they, along with their best friend Craig, devised a plan to get rid of Hutchings. This led them to organize a large Halloween party. On the eve of the incident, they journeyed to a secluded spot and excavated a shallow grave, approximately three feet in depth. During Halloween, Craig enticed Nikki from her residence. At the celebration, they incapacitated the young woman by spiking her beverage with a painkiller, leaving her scarcely able to control her legs. She was utterly incapacitated. Companions placed her in a vehicle, with Lauren at the wheel, transporting her to the predetermined grave site. Nikki, feeble, was escorted to a makeshift burial pit where Bowers delivered a blow to her skull using a bat adorned with a weighty metallic end. Craig believed a single hit would render her unconscious, yet it merely caused Nicole to stumble, prompting her to attempt to stand. Subsequently, Lauren seized a branch from White, assaulting her repeatedly until she fell into unconsciousness. Before Nicole ceased breathing, they disrobed her and cast her into the trench, subsequently covering it with dense soil. The most harrowing aspect of this narrative is that Nikki was still breathing at that juncture, perishing alone in the dense woodland, betrayed by two individuals she considered close on that dread-filled evening. Upon notifying the Hatchings family of Nikki's demise, her parents were astounded. Craig, whom they had welcomed into their home, and Lauren, a companion of Nikki. Jim's memory of identifying his daughter's dolphin insignia at the coroner's office is indelible. He expressed a desire to personally address these culprits, sparing the expense to taxpayers. Regrettably, legal constraints made this impossible. Nearly a year would pass before Lauren and Craig admitted guilt for the savage attack, each receiving a sentence of lifetime imprisonment without the chance for parole. The very nightmare they dreaded, which led to Nicole Hatching's death in an effort to shield another's offspring, had come to pass. Now, these fiends are condemned to recall the young woman who attained retribution, even beyond the grave. This tale begins in the eastern region of Australia, within Sydney, a thriving city inhabited by slightly more than five million individuals. Roughly 15 miles to the southwest of its borders is the unassuming neighborhood of Lugarno, housing a close-knit community of around 5,000 people. 
It is in this locale that the journey of Melissa Grimley, more famously known as Caddick, commenced. She would eventually transform into a persona that could instill fear in the hearts of anyone who had ever interacted with her. Melissa Louise was brought into the world on April 21, 1971, to Barbara and Ted Grimley. Her early years were filled with ease. Her father was employed by an insurance firm, and her mother worked as a physiotherapist. The Grimleys were part of the middle-class community, and her parents actively participated in the Lions Club, striving to support their local area. Melissa was a typical, inconspicuous child. She struggled academically, but developed an early love for fashion. Upon completing high school, Grimley pursued secretarial and business studies at Patrick's College in Sydney. Her initial role was as an administrator within the National Road Association's investment sector. Melissa harbored a deep fascination with finance. One night in 1992, the young lady decided to go out for a drink to relax following a hectic week. What started as one drink quickly became several, during which Grimley's attention was captured by the handsome features of a man seated close by. She was utterly captivated, only to regain her composure a few months later when she found herself without a penny. The man had exhausted her credit cards and taken numerous valuable objects from her residence. Grimley was left feeling utterly drained, but gleaned an important insight from the ordeal. Money and confidence, when entrusted to the unscrupulous, can result in dire outcomes. The lesson Melissa learned, however, would eventually not be employed to the advantage of others. In 1998, the ambitious professional landed a job as an office administrator at a Sydney-based branch of an investment bank. She was charged with managing substantial amounts of money, and despite having tasted the bitterness of financial misfortune herself, she proved to be no different from her former boyfriend. Within six months of her tenure, it was unveiled that Melissa had embezzled $2,000 from the company by falsifying the manager's signature on multiple checks. When the corporate headquarters became aware of the financial misconduct, rather than pressing charges and exposing the security lapse, they allowed her to voluntarily resign, avoiding police involvement. Furthermore, they didn't demand the return of the misappropriated funds, deeming the sum too insignificant to warrant public fuss. In an effort to divert her attention from the sour departure, Melissa turned to her private life. She encountered a British man named Tony Caddick, and by April 2000, the couple had wed. Melissa also dedicated herself to weight loss and staying in shape, engaging a personal trainer. Through this connection, she encountered various clients, including a highly esteemed financial advisor. This individual was a high-ranking official at a currency and finance firm in need of a new office manager. Naturally, Melissa seized every opportunity to stand out. Their friendship blossomed quickly, and she was subsequently recruited for the open role within his team. Diligently focusing on her role, Melissa thrived in her new duties, swiftly discerning which risks were judicious to take and which to eschew. By 2002, Caddick had amassed sufficient funds to contribute a $750,000 investment in the firm, subsequently gaining ownership of 25% of the company's equity. Melissa Caddick's achievements were so impactful and prosperous that she was featured on the cover of the sector's publication, Independent Financial Advisor, where she was lauded as wise choice, best practice planning in Australia. In the magazine, she cautioned against financial pyramids and assorted scam operations, urging investors to verify the credentials of their financial advisors, their qualifications, and their commitment to ethical standards. This prudent counsel would later take on a note of irony, as a year thereafter, Melissa found herself disenchanted with her constructive influence and aspired to diversify her investments into real estate and the stock market. Nonetheless, her employer maintained stringent policies and rebuffed her aspirations. Following a particularly intense disagreement, Caddick departed from the company in 2004, reclaiming her $750,000 investment. The abrupt shift in circumstances led Melissa and her husband Tony to relocate to England, where he had previously resided before their move to Australia. By the summer of 2006, leveraging Melissa's prior financial successes, the pair established themselves in a picturesque residence in Essex, 
to the northeast of London. Tony achieved his qualification as a lawyer and landed a distinguished position, a milestone that coincided with the joyous arrival of their son, symbolizing the family's pinnacle of achievement. Yet, transitioning to a new country, altering their lifestyle entirely, and even the joy of becoming parents, failed to fulfill Melissa. With Tony frequently commuting long hours between Essex and London for work, Melissa often found herself isolated at home. It might have been prudent for Melissa to seek employment. However, she instead allowed her attention to drift towards other men, culminating in Tony's discovery of her affair with a former acquaintance a few months later. This individual was, in fact, Melissa's personal hairdresser from Sydney, named Anthony Coletti, a charismatic and handsome man. Melissa covertly expended funds to whisk her paramour away to various European cities, indulging in new experiences under the guise of attending financial conferences to stay abreast of industry innovations. Tony, unwilling to condone his wife's betrayal, confronted her. Rather than offering an apology or admitting her wrongdoing, Melissa responded with fury, attributing her indiscretions to her husband's shortcomings. The confrontation nearly escalated to physical violence, prompting Tony to withdraw to his parents' place to de-escalate the tension, leaving Melissa and their son behind. Upon his return a few days later, he discovered Melissa, their child, most of the household's furnishings, and all their jointly held funds were gone. Melissa had effectively plundered their assets, liquidating their furnishings and apparel, and absconded back to Sydney with their son. Once back in her native country, she initiated a campaign of defamation against her husband, portraying him as the adulterer, a compulsive liar, a harsh individual, and a negligent father, though these accusations remained largely unsubstantiated. Shortly after her return to Australia in January 2012, Melissa swiftly reconnected with her new partner, Anthony Coletti. She also took control of the property in England and sold it, netting a whopping 1.3 million US dollars from the sale. With these funds, Melissa established a lavish lifestyle, settling into a sprawling residence featuring five bedrooms and five bathrooms, located in the Rose Bay vicinity. It was in this setting that Melissa Caddick's operation of a financial pyramid scheme officially commenced. Throughout her life, Melissa harbored aspirations of substantial wealth, yet her financial dealings frequently led to adverse outcomes. An early betrayal by a deceitful lover imparted a cunning lesson on the ease of manipulating money and trust when in nefarious hands. Leveraging these insights, Caddick commenced her deceitful practices, ranging from signature forgery on checks to ultimately leaving her husband utterly destitute. Melissa was unscrupulous in exploiting others for financial gain, quickly growing weary of monotony. She deliberated on ways to fulfill her ambitions, and a grand scheme began to crystallize in her thoughts. This concept was not new to her. She had entertained it for an extended period, but had not previously acted upon it. By this juncture, Caddick had amassed considerable wealth, yet she harbored no intentions of ceasing her pursuits. Dismissing the notion of profiting from merely a handful of individuals as trivial, she crafted an elaborate strategy designed to captivate a vast audience. In 2012, Melissa set her elaborate fraud into motion, ironically betraying the advice she once dispensed on a magazine cover about verifying financial advisors' credentials. She deceitfully portrayed herself as a financial advisor to her acquaintances and relatives, assuring them that investments with her would yield substantial legal returns. She enticed investors with promises of remarkable profits, despite lacking the necessary accreditation or expertise. Upon receiving funds, Caddick fabricated trading account screenshots and dispatched bogus monthly profit reports via email, displaying gains of 10, 20, or even 30 percent. These fabricated successes bolstered investors' confidence in Melissa, prompting them to either increase their investments or refer new clients to her. Caddick's bank balance swiftly escalated from thousands to millions as she swindled friends, ex-colleagues, her personal trainer, family members, and even her parents. Her spending became increasingly flamboyant and excessive, squandering her illicit gains on luxury automobiles, high-end fashion, art, and jewelry. 
she extravagantly expended over $48,000 on Chanel products, $275,000 on international travel, $229,000 at Dior, and more than $25,000 on protein shakes alone, all while maintaining an air of affluence that was unbeknownst to her family and friends, financed by their own losses. To cultivate an aura of exclusivity around her business, Melissa falsely informed potential investors that her ledger was full, only to later entice them with offers of supposedly newly available slots if they acted swiftly. By the year 2014, Melissa had purchased a lavish property on Orlando Road for upwards of $6 million. This luxurious mansion boasted stunning views of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, featuring expansive living areas, a swimming pool, and a large dining space with a panoramic view of the city. In 2016, she gifted her then-husband, Anthony Coletti, an Audi R8 valued at $390,000, personalized with a license plate representing his music label, marking his ventures as a musician and hobbyist DJ. Additionally, Melissa herself owned several high-priced vehicles. Since 2009, Melissa embarked on 25 international trips, exploring destinations ranging from the ski resorts of Aspen to secluded islands in the South Pacific, all financed by her circle of family and friends. Melissa's parents liquidated their family residence, located in southern Sydney, and entrusted the proceeds to their daughter for the purchase of a penthouse in Edgecliff, with the agreement they would retain a lifetime right to live there. Contrarily, Caddick listed the apartment solely under her name and diverted the funds towards purchasing a diamond valued at $590,000, among other personal expenditures. Melissa not only unscrupulously ascended to wealth, but also lavished millions annually on fulfilling her materialistic desires, enjoying stays at exclusive retreats, traveling on private jets, and affording any luxury she fancied. For a duration of eight years, Melissa's elaborate financial pyramid scheme persisted without retribution. She managed a Ponzi scheme, generating returns for early investors with the capital from new investors. Through her deceit, Caddick amassed approximately 30 million Australian dollars. However, as all things inevitably conclude, Melissa was acutely aware of this reality. She simply chose to disregard it. The foundation of her deceptive operations began to show signs of instability in 2019 when the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC, was tipped off that Caddick was operating as a financial advisor without the requisite licensing. Initially, this revelation did not lead to immediate action, but by June 2020, the situation garnered serious attention from investigators. It was uncovered that Caddick indeed lacked an Australian financial services license and had been illegitimately using the credentials of a previous colleague and friend by fraudulently adding her own name to the documents. This discovery gave the Commission ample cause for alarm, especially since Caddick had by then deceitfully extracted approximately 30 million Australian dollars from her clients. Authorities initiated rigorous surveillance of Melissa, meticulously documenting each of her transactions over the following months. This thorough investigation eventually culminated in the gathering of conclusive evidence of her fraudulent activities. On November 10, 2020, the regulatory body took decisive action by freezing Melissa's assets and seizing her passport. The subsequent day witnessed a search operation at Caddick's opulent mansion, appraised at over $6 million. During the raid, Caddick appeared visibly anxious, her behavior indicating an acute awareness of the precariousness of her situation, as the lavish lifestyle she had been leading was imminently threatened. Given the gravity of the fraudulent charges against her, she was potentially facing a significant prison sentence. Thus, it was hardly unexpected when, in the dawn hours of the day following the asset freeze and property search, Caddick vanished without a trace. On the brisk morning of November 12th, 2020, before the first light of dawn, Melissa quietly arose from her bed, dressed in her running attire, and silently exited the bedroom while Anthony remained asleep. She slipped into her sneakers and made her way to the front door. As she left the house, the soft click of the door was heard by her 14-year-old son, marking the last moment she was seen. 
Anthony reported his wife missing at 11.30 a.m. the following day, a full 30 hours after she vanished. The news of her disappearance triggered an intensive investigation by detectives who, in light of her recently uncovered fraudulent schemes, found her sudden absence highly suspect. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC, already scrutinizing her for financial deception, viewed her disappearance amidst spreading rumors of her fraud among investors with great suspicion. A week passed with no leads, plunging Melissa's family into deep anguish. They made public pleas through the media, urging her to come forward or at least signal that she was safe. The gravity of her actions weighed heavily, having defrauded millions from not just any individuals, but from some significantly influential figures alongside her own friends and family. These investors were all too aware of the lavish manner in which Melissa had misappropriated their investments. They knew her residence, intensifying the mystery of her whereabouts. Questions arose whether Melissa had chosen to vanish on her own accord or if retribution from a scorned investor had befallen her. Investigators initiated their search by scrutinizing Melissa's telephone records, discovering no subsequent activity post her disappearance. Crucial belongings such as her phone and keys were left behind in her home. Additionally, her banking activities ceased propelling the officers to examine local CCTV footage from the day she vanished. Despite their efforts, Melissa was not captured on any camera, indicating she might have exited the vicinity in a private vehicle or was possibly escorted away by someone else. An alternative hypothesis considered was that Melissa had not traveled far and opted to conceal herself in proximity, though this notion was deemed improbable. Amidst growing desperation, some conjectured that Melissa might have succumbed to despair, contemplating suicide by plunging into the ocean from the jagged cliffs, merely 900 feet from her residence. However, Anthony, along with other intimates, staunchly believed Melissa would not abandon her son, especially when faced with allegations that, albeit serious, might result in only a modest prison term or a hefty fine at most. This belief in her unwillingness to forsake her son led to the swift rejection of the suicide theory by her acquaintances and subsequently by the authorities, especially in the absence of any physical evidence or discovery of her body. The authorities broadened their search to encompass the entire Australian territory, as Caddick's travel document had been seized, rendering her unable to depart the country through legal means. Owing to the peculiarities of the case, information about Melissa's vanishing spread rapidly, not only within Australia but also abroad. Sightings of the woman were reported in Brisbane, Melbourne, and even Darwin. Now, with her identity known to millions, Melissa found herself with no place to conceal herself. The officials anticipated that Caddick would eventually come forward on her own. This situation persisted until 101 days later, the ocean ominously brought a ghastly item to the shore. On February 21st, 2021, a pair of beachgoers picking up litter along Burnda Beach on the coast of New South Wales spotted a grey sneaker from afar. Upon closer inspection, they realized it was attached to a foot, which was emitting a foul smell, with its contents decomposed and discolored. The sneaker, Having washed ashore just hours earlier contained a human foot and aligned with the size and characteristics of Melissa's shoes. As forensic experts embarked on DNA verification, oceanographic scientists delved into analyzing the Tasman Sea's coastal currents to figure out how this morbid discovery ended up on Bornda Beach, 250 miles away from the Caddick household. A week following the find of the human remains, DNA testing confirmed a match with samples obtained from Melissa's toothbrush. Family members also recognized the sneaker as that of the vanished woman. Despite the confirmation of Melissa's foot being found, there was widespread conjecture on whether she was deceased or still alive. Many speculated it was a strategy to elude punishment from swindled investors as her spouse, relatives, and acquaintances concurred she would not end her own life. This led to speculation about whether another party was involved in Melissa's vanishing. Caddick had defrauded numerous investors, absconding with their life savings. It's conceivable that one of these individuals sought vengeance, or perhaps it was a collaborator of hers, 
someone desiring to stay hidden and dodge incarceration. Melissa's life was disintegrating before her very eyes. Being apprehended meant the loss of her wealth, liberty, companionships, and her entire family. It's difficult to ascertain her thoughts that fateful morning. Could an epiphany have compelled her to leap from a cliff? The state of Melissa's foot, severely decomposed, led many experts to argue the improbability of it staying intact after 100 days in the ocean, prompting speculations of a contrived scenario. Ironically, Caddick was familiar with the beach, having spent numerous summer vacations there during her youth. Some theorize she might have severed her own foot and placed it there as a misdirection, a theory that continues to spark heated discussions. Anthony Coletti admitted his unawareness of his wife's financial deceit, believing their lifestyle was funded by legitimate means. Rumors circulated that Caddick had taken loans to invest in cryptocurrency, hoping to settle her debts with investors before vanishing, pondering over strategies to evade detection and emerge unharmed. With no fresh leads or evidence forthcoming, Melissa Caddick was officially declared dead, and the process of liquidating her estate commenced. To Anthony's dismay, his $390,000 vehicle was sold at auction to offer partial restitution to some investors, along with other assets. Despite the circumstances, the Dover Heights mansion technically remained under Caddick's name, as Anthony argued he required the funds to care for Melissa's child. He also claimed his bank account held merely $1.95, depending solely on the allowance provided by the security firm managing Melissa's seized assets. In May 2022, the federal court ordered Anthony Coletti to leave the mansion, and by October, the property was put up for auction. Subsequently, Melissa's collection of designer attire, art pieces, high-end goods, and jewelry was sold off. The revenue generated was allocated to partially offset the investors' losses, yet numerous defrauded parties ended up with nothing. Some had invested their entire retirement funds, while others liquidated their enterprises in the hope of emulating the affluence Melissa Caddick had projected. She had enticed them with visions of a lavish lifestyle and success, mirroring her own purported achievements. Anthony, who had taken up amateur DJing, dedicated himself to producing a music album centered on Melissa's mysterious disappearance. He contended that his wife was unjustly maligned and deemed the entire search operation as unlawful. Nonetheless, investigators remain puzzled about why he delayed reporting his wife missing and ponder his potential involvement in her disappearance. The saga of Melissa Caddick, the Australian who orchestrated her own financial empire, continues to be a puzzle. Her narrative has inspired numerous podcasts and even a television miniseries. The enduring question remains, what truly befell Melissa? Did a surge of guilt propel her to her doom? Was she a victim of someone's vengeance for her deceit? Or might Caddick still be alive, discreetly enjoying life on a distant island? Only time may reveal the actuality of these events. This narrative seems like a segment from a horror film, yet it is a portion of an actual incident that occurred in the Philippines on December 10th, 2021. When three masked intruders forced their way into the family residence, 17-year-old Janice found herself concealed beneath her bed. The invaders searched each room, and the girl managed to hide under the bed. Uncertain of when her bedroom door would swing open, she remained silent utterly still. Unable to make an emergency call for fear the conversation might be overheard, Janice, with shaky hands, began to send a message in the family group chat, hoping her parents, who were at work, would see it. At home with her siblings, she could hear their cries. It was 2.48 p.m. Frozen with fear, she didn't dare to move, while her distress signal remained unseen by her parents. Unsure of what other action to take or who else could help, at 3 p.m., she took to a social media platform, posting that intruders had entered the home. She was hiding under the bed, and she feared for her life. Then, the sound of footsteps nearing her door left her wondering if it was the assailants or perhaps assistants had finally arrived. Upon his return, Janice's father was met with the harrowing reality that two of his three children had not survived. This peculiar incident drew comparisons to a particularly notorious Hollywood horror film, 
where the unfolding events seem predictable at first, yet the outcome proves to be far more dreadful than one could have ever imagined. The dawn of December 10th, 2021, marked a day of unforgettable significance for the Maguad family. For the first time, Janice referred to her adoptive parents as mom and dad, a milestone moment for any parent who has welcomed a child into their lives. This act signified that Mr. and Mrs. Maguad had truly gained their daughter's trust, filling them with immense joy and sending them off to their jobs, feeling uplifted. While Cruz was teaching, a colleague discreetly informed him through his classroom door that his family's residence had been assaulted, urging him as the family's patriarch to hurry home immediately. Overwhelmed with panic, Cruz hurriedly left the classroom and sped to his vehicle. The drive from the school to his residence took approximately 15 minutes. Cruz was acutely aware that his three children were at home, potentially in danger. In his rush, he left behind his keys and found the front door locked upon arrival. He attempted to open it, shaking the handle and pushing against the door to no avail. Panic escalating, he loudly called out for his children, but was met with unsettling silence. Circling the house, Cruz's alarm intensified upon discovering a blood-stained blanket and a knife missing its handle by the door. He hurried to the back door, continuing to call for his children, yet the silence remained unbroken. Fortunately, he found the back door unlocked. Cruz paused, deliberating on how best to safeguard his son and daughters. With a brief moment of hesitation, he stepped inside, hoping to catch any intruders off guard and protect his children if they were being held captive. Moving quietly through the kitchen and into the living room, Cruz was confronted with a scene that instantaneously shattered his world. The entire lounge area was drenched in blood, with pieces of glass from shattered vases and items drenched in blood, including pots and baseball bats. At the heart of the chaos were the lifeless bodies of two of his three children, no longer alive. The perpetrator of this act was undoubtedly disturbed, unhinged, and furious. The extent of the injuries was horrific, with one of the victims missing an ear, which had been severed. One daughter survived by hiding under the bed during the assault, listening to every sound from beneath. What was meant to be one of the happiest days of Cruz Maguad's life morphed into an absolute horror. The moment he shut his eyes, the images of his son and daughter sprawled in the lounge haunted him. The Maguad household was made up of four individuals. The parents, Cruz and Lavella, along with their two adolescent children, 16-year-old Louis and 18-year-old Gwen. On a certain day, the siblings gathered their parents in the lounge to discuss the importance of welcoming a fifth member to their family. They proposed the inclusion of Gwen's 17-year-old friend, Janice. As an orphan, who had bounced from one home to another, serving as a live-in maid without any prospects for education, Janice had been thrust into adulthood at merely eight years old. The siblings convinced their parents to allow Janice to join their household, promising to undertake household chores in exchange for a sense of security and affection. Raised by Cruz and Lavella to extend a helping hand to those in dire straits, the couple deliberated and chose to offer Janice a shot at a stable life. In the Philippines, the absence of adequate resources or a support network for a young woman could tragically lead her to homelessness. The Maguads, deeply devout, believed that their capacity to assist someone else was a divine opportunity afforded by God's blessings on their family. Consequently, Janice was warmly welcomed into the family fold through formal adoption, with all legal formalities duly completed. Mr. Maguad was employed as an elementary school teacher and was well-respected, garnering accolades from his peers. His wife, Lavella, held the position of principal at the same school, meaning their income was modest. Yet within their community, they were deemed affluent due to owning land and being able to financially provide for their offspring. Louis Maguad, the family's youngest, stood out for his magnetism. Though serene in demeanor, he possessed a boundless vitality. Encounters with him often led individuals to divulge their innermost sentiments, as Louis exuded a warmth and empathy that encouraged openness. He was non-judgmental, intellectually curious, and artistic, engaging in guitar playing, reading, sketching, 
and harboring aspirations of pursuing a legal education post-high school. Gwen, his elder sister, was notably industrious and vivacious. Since her early years, she had advanced through every rank of the scouting movement, amassing a collection of badges for her accomplishments. In her senior school years, Gwen took pre-medical classes at a nearby university, aiming for a career in medicine. She devoted her leisure to volunteer work, always ready to lend a hand to those in distress. It was at a mutual friend's gathering that Gwen encountered Janice, who was employed as a nanny. While the festivities unfolded, Janice was preoccupied with childcare duties. Gwen was taken aback to learn that her contemporary was already engaged in work. As their friendship deepened, Gwen inquired about Janice's path to nannying, uncovering that Janice had been forsaken by her parents, left aboard a cargo vessel and discovered by a benevolent stranger. This kind soul attempted to locate Janice's family using social media and the internet by posting her details and photograph, yet no one claimed her. Consequently, Janice was entrusted to the care of the Philippine Social Services. Her earliest vivid memory was of feeling lost on a vast ship, yearning for a childhood unburdened by worries and longing for a mother's comfort after a minor fall. Janice aspired for academic success to facilitate college attendance, but her circumstances necessitated work over study. Gwen and Janice's bond strengthened as they spent time together, experimenting with makeup, hairstyles, conducting photo shoots, and creating TikTok content. Amid attempts to capture a dance routine they choreographed, Louis, the spirited younger brother, would often jest from behind the camera, eliciting laughter. Their camaraderie was filled with joy, leading the Maguad siblings to propose to their parents the idea of integrating Janice into their tightly knit family circle. Gwen and Louis's parents were notably disciplined. They refrained from indulging their offspring with lavish gifts and did not permit them unlimited freedom. Responsibilities were assigned to each member of the household. It was expected that all would contribute to housework. The children had to excel academically, participate in church services on Sundays, and support one another. Nevertheless, Gwen and Louis deeply admired their parents for their nurturing approach. The decision to adopt Janice underscored the tight-knit nature of the Magwad family. Subsequently, Janice took over Louis's room while he relocated to the living room sofa. Upon Janice's integration into the household, she was embraced as a full-fledged family member. The Maguads ensured her security. She was promptly registered for school, liberating her from the need to earn her own living. For the first time, she was able to embrace her youth and indulge in envisioning her future. The adoption brought the siblings closer. They persisted in their photography sessions, went on family vacations, savored their time off, and returned re-energized. Yet this does not imply that the transition was seamless or without its challenges. Many adoptive parents can attest to the difficulties faced when integrating a new child into the family. The child must adapt to unfamiliar surroundings, assimilate new guidelines, and build trust, a process that demands time. The Magwads benefited from Cruz and Lavella's educational insights, enduring patience, and their willingness to empathize with and comprehend their children's perspectives. The initial occurrence transpired a few months post Janice's incorporation into the Magwad household, which boasted a modest farm for pig rearing. Following the sale of a piglet, Cruz had a surplus of $200, which he stashed in a container in the living area for unforeseen expenditures. That month, an urgent need for medical care arose when Cruz's aging parents were hospitalized. But upon checking the container, Cruz discovered it was starkly empty. Each member of the household adamantly denied accessing the funds. Although not financially affluent, the Maguads were not excessively wealthy either, prompting a thorough search throughout their home for the vanished funds. The search extended for hours until one of the siblings uncovered a hidden compartment within Janice's backpack. Overwhelmed, Janice admitted her actions, having concealed the $200 inside a secret pouch she crafted in the bag. She struggled to articulate her reasons and broke down in tears. Cruz, far from furious, was simply baffled. Janice feared their wrath and anticipated expulsion for betraying their trust. 
The Magwads recognized that Janice's upbringing was vastly different from that of Gwen and Louis, having spent much of her life fending for herself. They were aware that such incidents of theft are not uncommon within households, particularly during the initial stages of integrating children from orphanages. This behavior often stems from a survival instinct, hoarding resources against future uncertainties, in fear of potential abandonment and returning to a state of need. Certainly the Maguad family felt let down, yet they didn't regard the incident as critically grave. It paralleled the instances when their own child erred. Now that Janice was their child, abandoning her was out of the question. They endeavored to comfort her, emphasizing that she no longer had to fret about her future as she was an integral part of their household. Following this disheartening event, the familial bonds strengthened, becoming more cohesive. With the shift to online education, Gwen took it upon herself to assist Janice with her studies. On December 10, 2021, as the parents were preparing to depart for work, Janice addressed them as mom and dad for the initial time, marking what should have been a momentous occasion. However, a significant revelation emerged. Janice, their adoptive child, was not an orphan as believed. She had been actively engaging with her biological mother through social media platforms. On December 10th, 2021, discovering his two offspring motionless at the center of the living room, Cruz knelt beside them, attempting to detect a heartbeat, but found none. Overwhelmed with despair, he appealed to the heavens, pondering why both were taken from him. Then, realizing he must look for his third child, he composed himself and proceeded upstairs. He advanced, hoping not to encounter another lifeless figure. Calling out for Janice, he was met with the sound of a door creaking open. He hurried into the room and began to urgently check her body for injuries, ensuring she was safe. The child was intact, yet inexplicably she was soaked. For an instant, Cruz was seized by fear, mistaking the liquid for blood. Janice, panting heavily, recounted to her father that three individuals had broken into their home, assaulting Gwen and Louis. She had managed to flee to her room and conceal herself under the bed. She was petrified by the screams that echoed below, feeling helpless about aiding her siblings until silence ensued. In her state of panic, she opted for a bath, a peculiar choice given the recent violence. The act of bathing, especially under such dire circumstances, was unconventional. Cruz struggled to grasp Janice's behavior but endeavored to offer solace. He aimed to remain resilient, though internally he felt as though everything was scorched. Mrs. McGuad arrived promptly after the law enforcement, finding Janice, drenched in both water and tears, on the veranda. She embraced the girl, expressing gratitude to the Divine for her safety, inquired about Gwen and Louis's whereabouts. It fell upon Cruz to break the harrowing news to Lavella that two of their children were victims of the assault. Mrs. Maguad, the head of an elementary school, was typically poised and decisive, even in emergencies, yet now she found herself shattered. She was devoid of answers, strategies, or even the faintest clue on how to proceed. They clung to each other in tears, as their residence was sealed off with tape, marking it as a crime scene. The police uncovered an array of evidence within the living room, featuring various items that might have served as weapons in the crime. A blood-stained baseball bat, a hammer, numerous kitchen knives, one of which was discovered near the entrance, pots, and shattered glass bottles. The authorities were tasked with gathering and documenting all pieces of evidence, to then correlate them with the injuries found on the bodies of the Magwad siblings. Gwen bore multiple stab wounds across her face, chest and abdomen. A blow to the face often suggests deeply personal motives, such as envy. The sheer savagery of these incidents is incomprehensible. Defensive injuries were evident on her hands and wrists, showing Gwen resisted fiercely to the very end. Her hair was caked with coagulated blood, and she was missing an ear. Upon examining Louis, the coroner identified 51 stab wounds. This level of violence transcended the mere act of taking a life indicating a profound personal vendetta. The extent of mutilation on the teenagers' bodies was such that mortuary staff had to sew up the wounds before the parents could proceed with funeral arrangements. The initial version was based on the testimonies of investigators. 
concluding that the criminals targeted one of the wealthier families in the area. They did not anticipate anyone being home, but when detectives noted the presence of valuable items like a TV, phone, and laptop in plain sight, they changed their opinion and dismissed the burglary theory. The second theory involved family disputes over land, with Lavella having siblings who claimed the land. Despite rumors of disputes over this land, investigators found nothing to support this theory and had to abandon it as well. The community and family sought answers as local residents feared for their safety, given that even teenagers were not spared by the criminals. The entire investigative unit focused on this crime, with the mayor offering a $5,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the attackers. Meanwhile, detectives decided to search the house and surrounding area again, expanding their search area. It was then they stumbled upon a vegetative stream near the Maguado house, essentially a small pond. They were incredibly lucky to find a small plastic bag caught on a branch in the stream containing blood-stained clothing, likely worn by the criminal after committing the act. Following this discovery in the pond, the police re-examined the Maguado house for clues, searching for anything remotely suspicious. Meanwhile, online users conducted their mini-investigation, unsatisfied with either the burglary or land dispute theories. They concluded, albeit unconfirmed, that the crime was committed by someone who survived. Such statements often hurt those who have already suffered greatly, but in this case, the online users had their evidence. First, regarding the unusual choice to bathe amidst such a crisis, Janice's decision to take a bath after hiding from the assailants, instead of checking on her siblings or alerting someone as the disturbance ceased, raised eyebrows. Online sleuths theorized that Janice's bath was an attempt to cleanse herself of her siblings' blood after harming them. Cruz Maguad, once the immediate shock of his loss diminished, also acknowledged the peculiarity of her actions. Initially, his overwhelming relief at finding his adopted daughter unharmed overshadowed any scrutiny of her behavior. Another puzzling aspect was Janice's silence during Cruz's frantic calls for his children. Given the modest size of their home, it seemed improbable that she wouldn't hear his cries. She only revealed herself after Cruz discovered the bodies of Gwen and Louie, adding to the suspicion. Additionally, the claim that the attackers invaded her room without noticing her, despite a thorough search, suggested either a lack of thoroughness by the intruders or a discrepancy in Janice's story. Forensic analysis found blood droplets in her room, which she attributed to the perpetrators who allegedly murdered her siblings. The timing of Janice's plea for help further complicated the narrative. She messaged her family group at 2.48 p.m., although autopsies indicated the Maguad siblings died around 2 p.m. This delay in seeking help almost 50 minutes after the cessation of their screams, along with a social media plea filled with emojis, struck many as incongruent with someone in a state of panic. Her decision to alter her surname on social media shortly after posting for help was also deemed ill-timed. Concurrently, law enforcement discovered blood spots in areas of the residence where, according to the young woman's account, they were unexpected, like the laundry area. Despite the absence of any struggle indicators, the presence of blood spots on the sink and floor invoked further inquiries. Once the evidence gathering concluded, the Maguad family received permission to re-enter their dwelling for cleaning. Amid this period, Lavella was utterly devastated. As detectives proceeded with their scrutiny, she grieved profoundly for her lost offspring. As her sorrow momentarily subsided, she found herself simply curling up, lying in wait for the grief and the sharp sting of loss to overwhelm her anew. Seeking a diversion, Lavella began tidying the home initiating with Janice's chamber. During this task, she encountered an ID card unfamiliar to her within their home, swiftly delivering it to the authorities. The ID was that of a 17-year-old male, known primarily by the moniker Marlin, whose actual name was withheld. Lavella had no acquaintance with Marlin, nor had she ever encountered him. Yet neighbors witnessed the youth en route to the Maguad residence on the day in question. A shopkeeper also recognized him, providing directions to Cruz and Lavella's abode. Additionally, 
A motorcyclist reported transporting Marlin to the location on the day the tragedy struck the teenagers. This discovery marked a significant breakthrough in the investigation, prompting the question of how Marlin's ID found its way into Janice's quarters. Summoned for interrogation, the officials hardly anticipated the girl could elucidate the presence of the ID in her room. However, Janice composedly acknowledged knowing the boy, subsequently breaking down to admit her involvement in her sibling's tragic end. Janice's confession remained undisclosed to the public due to her minor status, leaving the extent of her involvement in the tragic event somewhat ambiguous. It is known that Marlin, who worked at a church maintaining the premises for services, had some form of association with Janice, although the nature of their relationship and how they came into contact were not detailed in media reports. On her social media, a photo with a different young man was discovered, prompting police investigation. This individual, believed to be her boyfriend, had noticed Janice's plea for help online and attempted to contact her that day. When he called, the call was picked up but met with silence, leading him to eventually disconnect, assuming Janice might have exaggerated the situation. The investigation took a turn when Marlin was located by the police. His denial of involvement became untenable after Gwen's phone was discovered in his possession. Compounding his predicament, he had also been recently apprehended for possessing illegal substances. When the Magwood family took Janice in, they believed they were giving an orphan a chance at a new life, unaware that her biological parents were still alive. She maintained contact with her mother Michelle and Juanita on social media, revealing a more complex background than initially thought. Janice's early life was marked by significant hardship, with her family struggling to provide basic necessities, such as food, leading to a diet primarily consisting of sweet potatoes. Her father's frequent alcohol consumption due to financial strains added to the family's difficulties. The circumstances of how Janice became separated from her family remain unclear, whether she was abandoned or simply got lost, but she was indeed found alone on a cargo ship on September 22, 2013. The Mogwads offered Janice a semblance of the loving family environment she had never experienced. Witnessing the care and protection Gwen and Louis received from their parents, juxtaposed with her own traumatic upbringing, stirred a mix of emotions in Janice. Despite being adopted, she was treated with the same affection as the Mogwads' biological children and was expected to contribute to household duties equally. However, Janice struggled with the family's expectations and the shared affection and responsibilities, longing for undivided attention and the full extent of what the Mogwads could provide. Her desire to enjoy the privileges of being the sole child in the household led to a conflicted relationship with the reality of her situation, where love and material benefits were not exclusively hers to claim. On the fateful morning of December 10th, the day that would end in tragedy, Janice notably addressed her adoptive parents as mom and dad for the first time, signaling her belief that her ultimate aim was within reach. Janice was aware she could never surpass Gwen and Louie in the eyes of the Magwads due to their biological connection, and saw elimination as the only solution to this perceived inequality. Subsequent investigations revealed text messages in Tagalog on Janice's phone, suspected to be exchanges with Marlin, which unveiled her grim intentions. In these messages, she expressed a desire to end the lives of seven individuals without naming them and held a belief in divine forgiveness for her actions if she were to repent. Six days post the attack, on December 16th, authorities detained both Janice and Marlin, treating them as juvenile offenders rather than placing them in a conventional prison setting, owing to their minor status. During their separate trials, each was sentenced to 10 years for assaulting Gwen and an additional 22 years for the murder of 16-year-old Louis. The relatively mild sentences, attributed to their ages, sparked public outrage and the vehement disapproval of the Magwad parents. In pursuit of justice, Cruz and Lavella turned to the media and national officials, advocating for a reassessment of the judicial outcomes. In an emotionally charged interview, Lavella disclosed her willingness to forgive Janice, attributing her heinous actions to her disadvantaged background and lack of opportunities. However, a pivotal moment occurred during a face-to-face -face encounter with Janice in custody. 
Lavella looked into the eyes of the girl she had embraced as her own, searching for any sign of repentance or turmoil, but found none. Janice's gaze was void of empathy or regret, filled instead with a chilling detachment and resentment. This revelation compelled Lavella to retract her sentiments of forgiveness, recognizing that the girl they had welcomed as a blessing had, in reality, brought them an unimaginable nightmare. The tale you're about to be told might come across as the most enigmatic within the true crime category. A youthful sports enthusiast was relishing his holiday, but on an overcast day, to everyone's surprise, he disappeared. For numerous years, investigators were baffled by the potential outcomes. It was only several decades afterward that the answer emerged, causing a chill to run through those who remember the incidents of that particular day. Perched at an elevation of 10,000 feet amidst the magnificent Austrian Alps, the Stubai Glacier Resort stands as a distinctive and relatively undiscovered gem for travelers. The sole access to this location is via a gondola ride upward, whereupon an awe-inspiring panoramic vista greets you, making you feel atop the world. Yet beyond its heady beauty, the area is fraught with hazards, evidenced by numerous cautionary signs dotting the landscape. If you possess the audacity to ignore the restrictions here, you might find your life hanging by a thread at any instant. This was precisely the fate of a 23-year-old Canadian ice hockey athlete. Nonetheless, the narrative that unfolded was even more horrifying. On the 9th of August, 1989, Duncan McPherson left his diminutive red automobile in a verdant valley in Austria, not far from Innsbruck. He stepped out and paused for a moment absorbing the breathtaking scenery that unfolded around him. He found himself near the Austrian Alps, encircled by towering mountains. Born on the 3rd of February, 1966, in Saskatoon, Canada, Duncan was a remarkable defenseman for the Saskatoon Blades, anticipated to shine brightly in future drafts. In 1984, he was drafted by the Islanders, a professional ice hockey team in the United States. Unfortunately, his ascent to the Premier League was thwarted by a grave injury in September of that year, with subsequent injuries following. The continual setbacks left Duncan frustrated, aware that these obstacles were preventing him from achieving his dreams, leading him to reckon that his hockey career might be over. However, rather than succumbing to despair and hanging up his skates for good, McPherson chose to adapt. He embraced a proposition from the Dundee Tigers in Scotland taking up a role as a player coach. In 1989, Duncan made the decision to join a modest professional hockey team, aspiring to excel as a coach since his playing days were compromised. He was expected to commence his new role on the 12th of August. Prior to embarking on his new journey in Scotland, McPherson chose to enjoy a brief hiatus. The rigors of professional sports demand daily extensive training sessions for nearly the entire week, and Duncan decided to grant himself a holiday to roam across Europe, reconnect with old acquaintances, and explore new sites. One of his initial stops was in Germany, where an old friend from his childhood offered him a car. His next intended destination was the Austrian Alps. Notably skilled in skiing, McPherson harbored aspirations to master snowboarding. After relishing the idyllic environment, Duncan secured his car and made his way across the parking lot to the cable car station. The gondola, akin to a sky tram affixed to a cable and adorned with multiple windows, traverses the mountain's expanse, ascending and descending. While some visitors partake in the gondola ride solely for the spectacular vistas from above, its fundamental function is to ferry individuals to certain inaccessible locales on the mountain. The gondola Duncan intended to board was designed to transport riders from the station near the parking lot to an elevation of approximately 10,000 feet in the Austrian Alps. Adjacent to this was another station known as Ice Grotto, which was situated next to the Stubai Glacier Ski Resort. Stubai stood out not just for its wide range of slopes, but because the slope down which skiers and snowboarders glided was not merely a snow-laden mountain slope as typically found at most ski resorts. It was an actual glacier. During the warmer months, when other ski destinations worldwide ceased operations due to snow scarcity, Stubai Glacier Resort encountered no such issues. 
In the summertime, amid the heat, massive tractors known as snowcats, equipped with large rakes, would ascend and descend the glacier. They pulverized the top ice layer, converting it into snow powder. They refined the ski slope surface by pulverizing the hardened ridges and snow clumps into smooth, uniform particles. This allowed for skiing under any weather conditions. Upon arriving at the lift station and settling into the cabin, Duncan could once again marvel at the scenery through the window, the vibrant green of the valley gradually transitioning to the rugged, snow-capped Alps. His path led him to the equipment rental area, where he picked out a snowboard, boots, and all the essential gear for his downhill adventure. McPherson had prudently booked snowboarding lessons in advance. His initial session was set for 11 a.m. Fully kitted out, he awaited his instructor at the glacier's base. The instructor began with snowboarding fundamentals, teaching him how to fit the boots into the bindings, utilize the board's edges, and shared various safety guidelines. Rather than heading straight to the glacier, they started practicing on a level area below, focusing on the nuances of correct snowboarding technique. Only once the instructor deemed Duncan fully prepared did they move toward the button lift, a revolving cable with bars that skiers or snowboarders clung to with a bar while standing on their equipment, which then hoisted them up the slope. Duncan and the guide arrived at the glacier's summit and initiated their premier descent. Securing themselves on the snowboard, they began to inch forward, methodically navigating the incline step by step, mimicking the motion of a cascading leaf. As McPherson was a beginner, he meticulously adhered to his guide's directions, cautiously under his watchful eye. The guide offered Duncan advice on maintaining equilibrium, decelerating, or accelerating. He swiftly discerned Duncan's adeptness at balancing and self-stabilization, his leg strength matched that of a seasoned professional ice hockey player. Following a gradual hour-long journey down the glacier, they arrived at their destination. McPherson performed admirably, though their session concluded slightly prematurely due to a mild onset of rain. Numerous skiers ceased their pursuits and hurried back to the resort to escape the worsening weather. It was nearing 1 p.m., around lunchtime. Duncan and his guide opted for a quick meal. Mid-meal, the guide observed Duncan's sweater drenched through. He recommended Duncan shed his damp attire and offered to dry them in his office. By day's end, McPherson was to collect them. Acknowledging the wisdom in the suggestion, Duncan relinquished his soaked sweater to the guide. Meanwhile, Duncan visited a nearby store and purchased a new sweater. While dining, they delved deeper into personal stories and exchanged amusing anecdotes from their experiences. Post-lunch, as they gazed outside, the rain had subsided, giving way to dense fog blanketing the vicinity. While some skiers ventured back onto the slopes, others preferred to conclude their day. The guide commended Duncan for his commendable performance on his initial snowboard descent and proposed he return to the slope for solo practice of the fundamentals. Should he master these, more advanced techniques would be introduced the following day. Intrigued by the proposition and undeterred by the fog, McPherson, with snowboard in tow, made his way to the lift as the guide attended to another client. On the following day, Duncan's snowboarding mentor arrived at his workplace slightly ahead of schedule. Alighting from the gondola, he made his way to the resort procured a cup of coffee from the same cafe where he had dined with McPherson the preceding day, and after consuming his coffee, he collected his snowboard along with his gear and proceeded to the base of the lift to rendezvous with his pupil from the day before. Nonetheless, when the appointed time for their lesson arrived, Duncan was nowhere to be found. Having waited an additional span, the mentor felt a twinge of disappointment. He had taken a liking to his charge and was eager to impart further knowledge to McPherson that day. Yet he was aware that vacationers frequently forego subsequent snowboarding or skiing lessons for a myriad of reasons during their holiday, or they might simply overlook them. Regardless, the mentor didn't harbor it as a personal slight. He remained optimistic that the young man would make a return, particularly since his sweater remained unclaimed in his office. A week ensuing, Duncan's folks were taken aback by a phone call from Scotland by an official of the Dundee Tigers hockey squad. 
where their offspring was slated to commence a coaching role following his short stint in Europe. The caller was puzzled as to why Duncan had failed to report for duty. Disturbed, the parents were at a loss. Their progeny had been buoyant about the prospect of coaching the team and would not intentionally miss his inaugural day at work. They assured the team's envoy that they would attempt to reach Duncan and ascertain the cause. Nonetheless, following that conversation, the parents swiftly came to terms with the fact that contacting their son was unfeasible. Aware that Duncan had embarked on a European tour, they were clueless about his travel itinerary or the sequence of countries he intended to visit. It was the year 1989, a time when the convenience of making a call with a mobile phone was yet to be a reality. Bewildered about their subsequent steps, the parents couldn't fathom why their diligent son missed his first day at work. In a move that seemed rather extreme at the time, they opted to report him as missing to Interpol, which facilitates international police cooperation. Yet, both were cognizant of the likelihood that their case wouldn't be prioritized by any European law enforcement agency. At 23, Duncan was robust, intelligent, and mentally sound. The only apparent issue was his absence from a few initial days at a new job. It was conceivable he chose to prolong his holiday, albeit unprofessionally, but feasibly. Alternatively, he might have reconsidered the coaching offer or been merely held up. There were several rational reasons for Duncan's non-appearance in Scotland. The authorities suggested the McPhersons initiate their search instead of passively awaiting his return. Without delay, they embarked on this course. Packing their luggage, Duncan's parents ventured to Europe, driven by a sense of urgency and the intuition that something was wrong. Without even a hint of Duncan's European itinerary, they were at a stark disadvantage. Their basic strategy involved distributing countless flyers featuring their son's photo and a contact number across numerous cities. They followed up on every tip, no matter its perceived insignificance. Despite these exhaustive efforts, their progress was non-existent. A month into their quest, they managed to persuade several European news outlets to air a segment on Duncan. A broadcast in Austria proved pivotal. It mentioned the car Duncan used, a small red vehicle borrowed from a childhood friend, which he failed to return as promised. This lead took them to the Stubai Glacier's parking area where the car was parked. Upon discovering this, the McPhersons hastened to Austria to collaborate with the local police. Inside the vehicle, they uncovered Duncan's passport, a letter from his girlfriend sharing his enthusiasm for the move to Scotland, and a bag of spoiled fruit. This discovery propelled the Austrian authorities to intensify the search for Duncan. On the subsequent day, law enforcement officials scheduled a comprehensive search in the vicinity of the discovered vehicle. Duncan's parents were resolved to participate in the search effort. Upon their arrival at a local hotel, they adhered to their routine of distributing flyers adorned with their son's image to anyone they encountered in the lobby and affixed them throughout the premises. Serendipitously, one of these flyers found its way to Duncan's snowboard coach, who recognized the young man instantly, recalling the unclaimed sweater still in his possession. He informed the McPhersons that he had instructed Duncan in snowboarding, and noted Duncan's unexplained absence following their scheduled session. He further revealed that Duncan had never retrieved his sweater, marking the last instance he was seen or heard from. Duncan's mother's initial query concerned her son's disposition, whether he exhibited signs of stress, fear, or worry. The instructor, lacking detailed insights, endeavored to respond to their inquiries, noting Duncan's intention to practice snowboarding later that day. Upon receiving information that Duncan was last spotted at the Stubai Glacier Ski Resort, a contingent of police volunteers and a comprehensive search team ascended the mountain via lift. They meticulously scoured the glacier, descending the mountain's slope, thoroughly investigating the area without uncovering any evidence of Duncan's whereabouts or clues to his vanishing. This process was replicated on the following day, with a significantly enlarged search party covering not just the Stubai Glacier, but the adjacent mountainous expanse. Nevertheless, their efforts were fruitless. Consequently, to the profound disappointment of Duncan's parents, the official search was concluded after the second day. Nonetheless, the McPhersons remained undeterred, 
dedicating the next 14 years to the search for their son. They revisited the Stubai Glacier repeatedly, meticulously examining every section of the terrain, familiarizing themselves with every resort staff member and each contour of the ski slopes, their resolve never wavered. United by a singular ambition, they persisted in their quest to locate their son. In July 2003, a full 14 years after Duncan went missing, an employee at the Stubai Glacier Ski Resort was ascending the mountain via the tow rope. As was his custom, he glanced around the surroundings when a bright object on the slope caught his attention. Assuming it was litter, he intended to remove it and skied towards the yellow item upon reaching the top. However, as he neared, the shock of realization halted him. What he thought was trash turned out to be a fragment of a brightly colored jacket. This discovery eventually led to piecing together the events that likely transpired on August 9, 1989. Following a motivating lunch with his snowboard instructor, Duncan was eager to hit the slopes alone. The fog had descended upon the glacier, providing a serene, tourist-free environment ideal for a novice. With snowboard in hand, he confidently approached the tow rope and ascended to the glacier's peak. Ensuring his bindings were secure, Duncan commenced his descent through the empty, fog-enshrouded slope. With each meter, his confidence surged as he picked up speed, leveraging his innate balance and physical prowess. However, in a fleeting moment, Duncan lost control, snagged an edge, and was thrust forward into a fall, the impact breaking his leg and causing excruciating pain. Crevasses pose significant threats on glaciers, often being vast and inescapable, leading to immediate or delayed fatalities for those who fall in. The Stubai Glacier presented a unique hazard in the form of small, pothole-like fissures on its surface, particularly after rain. These crevices, though smaller, were diligently monitored by resort staff to prevent accidents. Skiers were typically cautioned to remain vigilant of such dangers to avoid mishaps, Yet, the dense fog during Duncan's descent obscured his vision, leading him to unwittingly step into a fissure, resulting in a broken leg. Positioned mid-slope, Duncan was too distant from both the base and the summit to seek assistance, and the fog's density ensured he remained unseen by others. Alone, injured, and stranded, he was left to contemplate his dire situation amidst the enveloping fog. At that moment, Another resort worker mounted one of the sizable snowcats stationed at the glacier's summit. These vehicles were generally employed to crush the upper layer of ice, converting it into snow. Given the day's rainfall and significant snowmelt, the worker had to traverse down the slope from the peak to the base, pulverizing the ice to lay down a fresh snow layer. Igniting the engine, engaging the rear rakes with their spinning metal blades and ensuring all systems were operational, the worker commenced the descent. The vehicle proceeded at a snail's pace, barely exceeding three miles per hour, due to the severely limited visibility caused by the mist. Abruptly, at the very last moment, the operator spotted something right in his path. With a swift maneuver to the side, he narrowly avoided a collision, almost making it. However, the heavy treads skirted dangerously close, and the back rakes with their whirling blades snagged the object, dragging it a few feet. The operator immediately shut down the engine, leapt out, and rushed to inspect the object. To his shock, it was a person lying there, Duncan McPherson. The whirling blades had gruesomely disfigured his body. One arm was entirely severed and shredded into pieces, and a leg was nearly completely cut off. It is speculated that Duncan wasn't dead at the time. The injuries were severe but not instantly lethal. In theory, he might have been rescued. Nevertheless, Overwhelmed by panic and believing he was unseen due to the fog, the worker made a dire choice. Thinking he was responsible for striking the young man, rather than assisting Duncan, he opted to bind him to the snowcat and haul him to a deep crevasse on the glacier. Casting McPherson, possibly still alive, into the crevasse with his severed limbs, the worker employed the snow vehicle to cover the crevasse, concealing his actions. Duncan's demise was sealed in a frozen tomb. Over the ensuing 14 years, the glacier gradually receded until the sight of Duncan's yellow jacket emerged on the ice's surface. 
This is what the resort worker observed while ascending on the ski lift, mistaking it for debris. Skiing down the slope to retrieve the jacket, he was confronted with the visage of Duncan McPherson, encased in the ice. The young man appeared as though he was still 23, his features preserved by the ice's frigid temperatures, which prevented any decomposition. Initially, the belief was that Duncan had accidentally tumbled into the crevasse during his descent, finding himself ensnared in a frosty snare from which he could not escape, leading to his demise. The injuries he bore were presumed to be inflicted by the shifting ice, yet upon the recovery of his body, it was evident he had been cleaved into sections, his apparel ripped apart, and his snowboard shattered into fragments. All remains and broken parts of the snowboard were discovered in proximity. Had Duncan been dismembered by the glacier's natural dynamics, the pieces would have been dispersed at varied locations. This revelation suggested that the young man's death was not simply a result of falling and freezing. He had encountered a tragic end due to a collision with heavy snow-clearing machinery. Duncan's parents were merely notified of the recovery of their son's remains, with the explanation that he had met with an accident years prior. Desiring the full story, the McPhersons sought the expertise of an independent investigator. The analysis of the body parts and snowboarding gear by a range of professionals, including forensic experts, radiologists, and medical doctors, unanimously supported the theory that McPherson had been struck by snow-clearing machinery, after which his body was concealed beneath the ice. Author John Leake, after scrutinizing the photographs depicting the injuries of the late hockey player, penned a book named Cold a Long Time, an Alpine Mystery. In it, he elaborated on this case. The operator of the snowcat present on the slope that fateful day was never formally recognized or prosecuted due to the expiration of the statute of limitations. Accountability for the demise of Duncan McPherson, the youthful Canadian hockey player, has remained elusive. In an effort to avoid controversy, the event was eventually dismissed as a sorrowful mishap. When justice fails to penalize wrongdoing, fate steps in. This tale is so astonishing that it's hard to accept it truly occurred. Brenda Sue Schaefer was born in April 1952 and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, where she encountered her first significant other, Van, during her initial year of high school. The pair quickly became deeply enamored with one another, their bond appearing incredibly tender and innocent initially. They were inseparable and eagerly anticipated their marriage to explore physical closeness. Immediately after graduating, Van proposed to Brenda, who accepted with enthusiasm and excitement. Yet despite their relationship's outward charm, not everything was as idyllic as it appeared. Brenda was constantly under her family's watchful eye, leading her to be quite naive, purely innocent, and insecure about herself. Moreover, she relied heavily on Van, her boyfriend, who was sociable, active, and notably controlling towards Brenda. He relished his role as the decision-maker in their relationship and appreciated that his girlfriend was gentle and submissive, significantly influencing nearly all her actions. The first major issue the couple encountered post-marriage was a stark sexual incompatibility. Brenda, always reserved and somewhat conventional, and the adventurous Van, who sought excitement and diversity in their intimate life. Brenda started questioning their compatibility and whether she could endure her husband's robust nature indefinitely. Raised in a strict Catholic household, divorce was never an option for her, as she was taught by the Catholic Church that married partners should remain together and address challenges jointly, no matter the circumstances. Meanwhile, Van secured a dispatcher position at the Louisville Police Department. Although the salary was modest, it didn't prevent him from indulging and spending liberally on non-essential items, leading to the second major issue, financial disputes and management. Brenda frequently criticized her husband's careless financial habits, adding tension to their union. Additionally, Van began to consume alcohol excessively and use numerous recreational drugs, amplifying Brenda's growing resentment towards him. Nonetheless, truly cherishing his wife and recognizing the dire direction of their relationship, he proposed they seek marital counseling to have a relationship expert address their problems. 
The duo sought help from a psychotherapist, yet this move made no significant difference in the dynamics between Van and Brenda. After three years together, it became painfully clear that their profound incompatibility was insurmountable, and no remedy seemed plausible. Despite Brenda's attempts at moderation, the fourth year was marred by constant toxic squabbles, pettiness, and mutual resentments. Happiness eluded both in their partnership. Brenda started to seriously consider divorce, even discussing it with her parents. Her mother was entirely in favor, whereas her father held a contrary view, arguing that Brenda wasn't putting enough effort into her marital happiness. He voiced his discontent, urging her to persevere and resolve their issues. Nevertheless, Brenda made a final attempt to salvage their marriage, but ultimately chose her own well-being, proceeding with the divorce. The stigma and discomfort of being a divorced woman paled in comparison to the dread of a joyless and toxic union for the rest of her life. Post-divorce, Brenda embraced her independence and singlehood, dedicating herself to her career. It was a while before she was ready to entertain the idea of dating again. However, during a casual visit to a local store, she encountered Jim Rush. Jim was strikingly handsome, full of charm and charisma. A dentist by profession, he showed a sincere interest in Brenda. Encouraged, Brenda decided to take a chance on him, a decision she found no cause to regret. Jim lavished her with presents, offered tenderness and affection, arranged romantic evenings, and conveyed his love for Brenda in myriad ways. In a grand gesture, Jim even leased a billboard near downtown Louisville to publicize his affection, proclaiming the billboard too small to encapsulate his love for her a move that deeply touched Brenda. The pair frequently journeyed to exotic islands, and occasionally they took holidays alongside Brenda's family. Every family member anticipated that, in time, they would marry. Yet, as was the case initially, not all aspects of their union were as idyllic as they appeared. Jim was revealed to be dependent on alcohol. Having endured a failed marriage previously, Brenda was cautious not to overlook warning signs. Her reservations about wedlock deeply troubled Jim, but evidently it wasn't sufficient to deter his drinking habits. After years of cohabitation, Jim penned a note to Brenda, voicing his disillusionment along with other trivial complaints concerning their partnership, proposing they part ways. Caught off guard by such a development, Brenda was devastated. Despite her reluctance to wed him, she loved him and clung to the hope that Jim would transform into the partner she yearned for. Nevertheless, he showed no inclination to alter his ways. Brenda and her closest confidant, Joyce, shared remarkably parallel romantic entanglements. Both ended relationships with their significant others and resolved to seek companions who were stable, seasoned, financially sound, and of a more advanced age for their next chapter. Joyce led the way by entering a relationship with a man who embodied their ideal. Aiming to aid Brenda in moving past Jim, she introduced her to an acquaintance of her new beau. This gentleman was none other than 48-year-old Melvin Ignatow. Melvin Henry Ignatow, a native of Pennsylvania, was born on March 26, 1938, and later relocated to Louisville for employment opportunities. At the time he met Brenda, he was 14 years her senior a divorced father of three, yet he was financially stable and came highly recommended for his stellar personality by his friends. Joyce, eager to see her friend happy, arranged a double date that included Melvin, encouraging Brenda to simply meet him without any commitment. The group embarked on a maritime excursion, enjoying each other's company immensely. Brenda found herself connecting with Melvin so well that he asked her out for an additional date, this time for just the two of them. Their subsequent meetings only served to deepen their connection, with Melvin showcasing the empathetic, loving nature that Brenda found to be refreshingly genuine and unlike any of her previous relationships. His affluence, manifested in a luxurious home, a yacht, and a stylish sports car, were undeniably appealing. Brenda was less attracted to Melvin physically, but this seemed a minor trade-off given his other attributes. However, she was blissfully unaware of the complex challenges that would emerge later on. Throughout their two-year union, Melvin's behavior towards Brenda evolved into increasingly possessive and authoritarian, 
marked by an overprotectiveness that bordered on obsession. He displayed clear signs of possessiveness and narcissism, which did not sit well with Brenda's family, raising serious concerns about his conduct. His habit of incessantly calling Brenda at her workplace to monitor her interactions, especially criticizing her amiability with her colleagues and her superior, led to his unpopularity among her co-workers. When away on international business, Ignato meticulously scheduled their calls, often ignoring the local time in Louisville, resulting in multiple disruptive calls throughout the night. Yet this was merely a portion of the daily challenges Brenda endured. In their private life, Brenda felt a stark disconnect with Melvin, particularly regarding their sexual compatibility. She disclosed that Ignata was keen on exploring his sexual fantasies, which included bondage, sensory deprivation, and group activities, all of which Brenda found objectionable. Despite her initial firm refusals, Melvin's persistent coercion led her to reluctantly try to accommodate his desires on a few occasions. His insistence reached a point where he introduced pills, allegedly to enhance her libido without disclosing their nature. Reluctantly, Brenda agreed to take them, only to find herself losing consciousness, later awakening in agony with no recollection of the events that transpired. The recurring episodes of Blackout induced fear in Brenda, leaving her deeply concerned about the extent of her partner's willingness to exploit her vulnerability. Brenda confided her anxieties to a friend, who recommended she terminate her relationship. Following this advice, Brenda reached out to her former boyfriend, Jim, revealing her dissatisfaction with Ignato and detailing the horrific experiences she had suffered. Jim similarly encouraged her to leave him. On September 21, 1988, Brenda contacted Jim to announce that she had ended things with Melvin. She expressed the need to see him one last time to return some jewelry he had given her. Ignato, both upset and heartbroken over the separation, turned to his previous love, Marianne Shore, whom he had been involved with prior to Brenda. Their affair was marked by intense passion, yet the issue was Mary's unreciprocated love for Melvin and her desire to marry him. Nevertheless, Melvin regarded her merely as an outlet for his desires, lacking any emotional attachment or intentions of integrating her into his life on a permanent basis. Contrary to Brenda, Mary was consistently adventurous and eager to engage in whatever Melvin proposed. They sporadically continued their liaison, even during Melvin's time with Schaefer. Marianne preserved her intense affection for him, yearning for even minimal recognition. Aware of his involvement with another due to Melvin's transparency, this knowledge led her to resent Brenda deeply. Driven by jealousy, Mary felt she stood no chance of reclaiming his affection as long as Brenda remained a contender. Merely three days following Brenda's breakup with Melvin, on September 24th, she vanished. Her automobile was discovered abandoned adjacent to the Interstate 64, with its right tires deflated and a window broken. Although the car radio was gone, the presence of bloodstains on the rear seat was particularly disturbing. Following Brenda's vanishing, her kin and friends, including Melvin, convened at her family home. Melvin, appearing more distraught than the others due to being the last known individual to have been with Brenda, drew suspicion and inquiries about their last encounters. He detailed the day Brenda returned the jewelry. She fetched him at around 3.30 p.m. They toured the city relishing their time together, visited the Oxmoor shopping mall, enjoyed a meal, and she left Ignatow at his mother's place close to 11.30 p.m., marking the last moment he saw or communicated with her. Subsequently, Melvin used his mother's vehicle to head to Skyline Chili for another meal, confirmed by the assistant manager who spotted Ignatow there alone around midnight. Questioned about not using his vehicle, Melvin cited mechanical issues, despite arriving in that same car at Brenda's parents' place the next day, raising eyebrows. Additionally, Melvin professed that he and Brenda were happily advancing towards marriage, a claim contradicted by common knowledge. Authorities also suspected Ignato's role in Brenda's disappearance. Summoned to the precinct, he anticipated needing legal representation and brought along a lawyer friend to assist in the search. During the interrogations, Melvin attempted to steer the discussions, 
inundating officers with his inquiries while casually addressing them by first names, as though they were acquaintances. As media coverage intensified around Brenda's case, spotlighting the turmoil within her relationship with Melvin and his status as the last person to see her, public and investigative suspicion towards him grew. Melvin found himself in a fervent bid to establish his innocence, with public scrutiny significantly disrupting his routine. He faced accusatory glances and judgments in places as mundane as the post office or supermarket, branded by many as a felon. The authorities found themselves at an impasse. With a prime suspect in sight, they lacked witnesses, a body, and concrete evidence to connect Ignatow to the crime. As months passed, Brenda's fate remained a mystery. Within the U.S. legal framework, a grand jury evaluates the evidence submitted by the prosecution to determine if there's enough basis for a charge. However, the absence of concrete evidence against Ignatow led the prosecutor to offer him an opportunity to testify in his own defense, hoping to clear his name. Despite his attorney's cautions against doing so, Melvin, exhausted by the cloud of suspicion, chose to testify unintentionally providing the prosecution with valuable information. Ignato mentioned his former girlfriend, Mary Ann Shore, during his testimony, and he recounted having a chloroform-soaked towel by the bed, allegedly for allergy relief during the night. His discomfort became palpable when discussing the chloroform, puzzled by the prosecutor's insight into such private details of his life. Unbeknownst to him, Brenda had shared her concerns about the chloroform with her loved ones, fearing Melvin might use it on her as she slept. Seeking to sway the grand jury, Ignatow expressed suicidal thoughts, stating his despondence over Brenda's disappearance had robbed him of his will to live, with only his religious faith keeping him from self-harm. He lamented the emotional toll taken by media scrutiny and described feeling persecuted by the general public. The prosecutor found Melvin's account credible and compelling, until he claimed his alibi on the night of Brenda's disappearance was his presence with Shore. This claim piqued the prosecution's curiosity, prompting them to summon Shore as a witness, leading the case in an unexpected and startling direction. Mary Ann Shore was ill-prepared for her courtroom appearance and showed visible signs of nervousness when questioned about her acquaintance with Brenda. Her attempt to respond resulted in a confused mix of statements, leading her to abruptly exit the courtroom in distress and tears. It took a while for her to regain composure and come back. Observing that Mary's conduct was exacerbating her situation, her attorney suggested a plea bargain to circumvent a protracted incarceration. Shore consented and unveiled the grim reality behind Brenda Schaefer's fate. Melvin Ignatow had meticulously orchestrated the scheme days prior to Brenda's vanishing. He shared with Mary a checklist of items necessary for restraining and tormenting Brenda. Shore consented to Ignatow carrying out his scheme at her residence. They even performed a test to check if screams were audible from outside by having Mary scream inside a room while Ignatow verified from the street. They also excavated a sizable pit in the backyard, meant for Schaefer's burial. The night Brenda drove him to Marianne Shore's home, Ignatow disrobed Schaefer secured her to a glass coffee table, and savagely attacked her repeatedly. The agony persisted for hours, with Shore capturing the ordeal on camera. Ultimately, after subduing Schaefer with chloroform, they wrapped her body in rope, encased it in a trash bag, and interred it. This disclosure stunned all attendees. They had suspected Melvin of involvement in Brenda's disappearance, but were not ready for the macabre specifics. Following his arrest, Ignatow's bail was fixed at half a million dollars. Forensic experts excavated the makeshift burial site in Marianne Shore's backyard, finding Schaefer's remains exactly as Shore had depicted, confirming her account. Brenda had been buried in the moist soil for 16 months. The search for the photos that would corroborate Ignatow's guilt ensued, yet they remained elusive. The trial was relocated to Kenton County to mitigate juror prejudice. Even though Brenda's remains were discovered and Mary admitted her involvement, no direct physical proof linked Melvin to the act. Ignatow's legal team contended that his participation was purely conjectural, suggesting Mary might have acted independently, driven by envy towards Brenda. 
Mary's behavior in court was peculiar, marked by laughter and grimaces, diminishing the gravity of the trial. Her apparent lack of guilt led jurors to question her honesty, while Ignatow consistently refuted any complicity. After a brief two-hour deliberation, the jury acquitted Melvin of all accusations. Despite nine out of twelve jurors suspecting Ignatow performed the acts Marianne depicted, the lack of concrete evidence led to his discharge from custody on December 23, 1991. Distressed by the verdict, the presiding judge personally extended an apology to Brenda's kin, lamenting the judicial system's inadequacy. Financially drained by his defense, Melvin liquidated nearly all his assets to afford his legal expenses. Mary Ann, sentenced to five years, was granted early release after serving three due to commendable conduct. Nonetheless, her demise at 58 followed a series of health complications, marking a sorrowful conclusion to her life. In subsequent years, Ignatow's property's new proprietors unearthed a concealed cash within the floorboards during refurbishments, revealing Brenda's ornaments and rolls of undeveloped film depicting Melvin's maltreatment of her. Yet, legal constraints prevented his retrial for the identical offense, even with the emergence of this evidence. He faced perjury charges for his court lies about not murdering Brenda Schaefer. Upon confessing to his deceit, he received a minimum of eight years' imprisonment. Despite expressing regret to the Schaefers and asserting Brenda's last moments were devoid of suffering, his appeals for sentence reduction were rejected. Confronted with an additional federal perjury charge, he incurred a further nine-year penalty. Melvin completed his sentence, obtaining release in December 2006. About two years later, on December 1, 2008, at the age of 70, a glass coffee table accident occurred at his residence marking the end of his life almost two decades after Brenda Schaefer's death, but justice was restored. This is the end of the video. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new stories. This was Jeremy. See you later.